All right. Well, hey, friends, welcome to Halfway There. This is the show where we have honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience. I am, as always, your host, Eric Nevins, and I'm glad to have you on board. Thanks for downloading. Thanks for uh, just checking out the show. Um, If you haven't told a friend about it, uh, I hope after this episode you will. It helps us uh, helps us grow. Lets people more people know and have the same experience that you're having. Uh, Today, I'm excited to bring you our guest. Our guest, uh, he has a very interesting story as a as a post office mailman in the '80s who. uh, Ended up uh, turning into a real estate mogul. That's what I'm going to call him. His name is Tom Nardone. Tom, welcome to Halfway There. Thanks for having me on the show. Eric. Are, it's are a you, pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Are you okay being called a real estate mogul? Ah, uh, that's fine. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> I could do worse, but maybe maybe we'll, we won't do that. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for being here. Uh, go ahead and just tell us a little bit. That's that's sort of like a broad brush I painted of you, but tell us a little bit about who you are and where God has you right now. Sure, sure. Well, I'm here in sunny South Florida in the Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton, Miami area. Um, originally from the Northeast in the New York area, actually a Jersey boy. And like a lot of East Coasters, worked their way down here to Florida. <laughs> nice. And uh, I, I guess I got pulled to Florida because I had an aunt who came down here when I was just 12 years old. And they they actually kind of got into this whole like Bible gospel thing down here. And they invited me to a youth ranch meeting back when I was like 12 years old. That's where I actually got you know, accepted Christ as my savior. Yeah. But, uh, it was very different from the Holy Roman, a Catholic, a church in my big Italian family I come from. I bet. And, uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's how I found my roots to Florida. I always loved coming down here to visit relatives and move down here when I became an adult. Yeah. It's a beautiful place down there. It's a good place to yeah. be. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. So, but you're, you're doing right now, you're, you, you're writing books and you're doing real estate. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I. Uh, it, it all started when. We'll, we'll you know, go back. We'll go back in your story because I want to hear a lot. But just tell us about what you're doing now. Okay, right now I do a lot of uh, house flipping, and basically my major part of my work life is I'm a house flipping coach, and I have an active house flipping business where we buy, we hold, we rent, we wholesale houses, and. Uh, do fix and flips. So it, it kind of rolls all year long down here because the weather's yeah. so nice in South Florida. Yeah, I love that. Very cool. So that's kind of a cool occupation, right? Flipping houses. Everybody thinks that it's probably a little bit glamorous, and I'm guessing you have some stories to suggest otherwise. Well, you know, it is a lot of work. <laughs> and for those of us who were around 10 years ago for the real estate crash, we know that, wow. Um, that was a challenging one. Yeah, I, bet. <laughs> I was on my knees most of that time. Absolutely. Um, but you know, we pulled through. We're still here, still alive in business. We had to give a lot back, but you know, we didn't give everything back. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, you talk about trials to your faith and questions to God. That's when you go through trials like that. It's really can. Oh yeah. Can just yeah, it has you go deeper. Absolutely. That's it does. Absolutely. That's a, a major theme on this show. We talk about all the time. I can't wait to hear about how that what that experience was like for you. I'll tell you what, just to be on the other, tell you about the other side. Uh, I'm super grateful for the crash because I couldn't have bought a house in Colorado if it didn't happen, right? Because there's a uh, we ended up getting a short sale after several years after that, and uh, the that was the only way we could have afforded them what I what I was making at the time. So. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. It's, you know, the market has something for everybody. Absolutely. I felt so bad for the family, but yeah, they made choices that I didn't have anything to do with. So anyway, um, yeah, I appreciate that. So I want to hear about your story. You mentioned that you, you came to faith when you were at like a, sounds like a church camp or something like that down, down there in Florida. Tell me about that when you were 12. Yeah, I was, uh, 12 years old and I always took guitar lessons since I was like eight or nine years old. So my aunt one day, she uh, kind of came to the house where I was staying at my grandmother's a mile or so away. And she said, hey, we're going to have like a uh, youth ranch meeting at our night, at our house tonight. And I was like, well, what's that? And she was like, oh, it's a gathering of young people like your age. You would have fun. Why don't you come over? 
And I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know anybody. And then she said the magic word. She said, I mean, there's going to be guitar players there and you're a guitar player. So nice. you should bring a guitar. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> so I went and uh, heard the message on the first night. And uh, that, that's how I came to Christ as a Christian was that night. Oh, that's awesome. So you branch. You, you're, it sounds like you already had a Catholic background. Yes, I did. So I was really plugged into the Catholic Church ever since I was five years old. And um, my Italian roots and my yeah. Roman Catholic roots run actually very deep. My mom is actually from Italy. Wow. And she didn't come to this country till she was like 14 years old. So I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church in the New York area. And uh with all due respect to you know, my Catholic upbringing, it was, it was healthy. I got to learn all the stories about, you know, Jesus and Noah's Ark and all these different things. So I had it rooted, but it never really just kind of jived or connected until I saw it in a more contemporary way here in South Florida. Yeah, that's interesting. So it seemed to you as a, as a kid, kind of this old, like interesting stories, but kind of in the past and not really relevant for right now. Yeah, it was kind of something you did because, uh, you know, mommy and daddy believe this, so you believe this too. Yeah. You know? Totally. Yeah. So that night at your grandma's house, it was your grandma's house, right? It was actually at my aunt's oh, house. Oh, your aunt's house. Yeah. Okay, your aunt's house. Yeah. Um, you gave your life to Christ and you found it much more compelling. What was it about about in that meeting that really, I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit, but what was it that kind of drove you? Um, well, it, it was, what drove me was, you know, I had a lot of unanswered questions as, as a young teenager and kind of a lot of that stemmed from going to public high school. It's like the things they taught you were sort of like diametrically opposed to, to the things you learned in church growing up, <laughs> Right. you know, from evolution to all these different theories. I'm like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't weigh with this and that. So, you know, I was sort of confused and sort of searching. And when I went to this youth ranch, the, the pastor and his wife, they were like 16 or 17 years old. <laughs> I was 12. Wow. So they were like adults to me. And I remember them pulling up in this Volkswagen Beetle with surfboards uh, on the roof. <laughs> and he's and he was barefoot. They were both barefoot. And they were like, hey, we're here to do the tonight's, uh, uh, you know, praise and worship and Bible study. And I'm like, you're like a, you're a priest. I mean, I don't <laughs> understand it, you know? And, uh, so it was, you know, Christianity in a contemporary form to me, which was cool as a young teenager. And I was like, well, I, I, this, this is really hip. I can get into this. And, and that was kind of their draw, you know, that obviously, you know, they want to appeal to youth and grab them at, at the right time. And I was there and I was ready. Yeah. Was that like, so I don't, I don't know when this is, and I don't want to date you or anything, but it was that like, I'm thinking it's sort of Jesus culture kind of time period or what, what was that? <laughs> well, I'm, no, confessions be out. I'm 59 now. Okay. So I'm, I'm going back to like 72, this is the 70s, 74. Yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking like the Jesus, Jesus movement kind of, kind of thing. Yeah. He it sounds very hip. Probably at the very early roots. Cause there gotcha. was a lot of really st- staunch, um, just like really stiff teaching out there. I, I remember mm -hmm. going to Bill Gothard events and Ooh. I don't know if you've ever been to any of those, but <laughs> I praise the Lord. I have not. And, uh, Look. at the risk of offending. So I don't know if anybody who is in Bill Gothard's circle would listen to the show, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> definitely not a, not, not a fan. Sorry. Yeah. The, 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 um, expressions made here aren't representative of, of this show. <laughs> um, it's no, no it problem. Just, I, I guess even you, even modern Christianity can stuff be stuffed into, uh, this is what you do. This is what you don't do, you yep. know, in a very legalistic way. Yeah. So one of the things I keep talking about this because it, for me right now is just one of the huge, uh, issues going on in the church. It's kind of changed how I see everything, but if, if we define spiritual maturity as how much you know and how much you do, right, then you get a certain result, Right. And leaders start to wonder why they're not making a difference or why people are not uh, doing the right, the right kind of things that they're telling them to do or coming to their events or whatever. And, uh, but if we define spiritual maturity as loving as Christ loves, that's a whole different deal, right? That's right. That then leads to different kinds of actions and different kinds of involvement. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think there's different varieties of, of, 
you know, what you know. Um, certainly there were some of those, um, yeah, back, you know, in the, they're all over. So we, we don't have to go into that. Um, so tell me about, so you found, so you came to Christ at this thing. They kind of answered your questions. Here is this, um, much more modern expression of Christianity. And you're like, okay, this is great. Where'd you go from there? Cause you know, the follow-up is, is just as important in how you learn. So did you end up going to your aunt's church or what, what happened? Well, you know, I was only in Florida as just kind of a visitor oh, yeah. because the first time I went, I was like, wow, I want to do this every summer. And my cousin and I, who is a guy, my cousin Ron, uh, the two of us were both about the same age and we have the same grandmother, same aunt. So as cousins, he was like my best friend. We only lived a block apart and we would go and spend our entire summers here when school would get out for summer. So I would go back to my old environment and I would see the things I learned about how wrong they were. Mm. And back in the 70s and the 60s, there was a lot of drug culture going on. Everybody smoking weed. And, um, and <laughs> is that any different today? <laughs> I don't um, necessarily. Not in Colorado, my friend. No, no <laughs> never. <laughs> no, no. So, um, you know, the, the, the things I, I saw, I, I knew were wrong. But some things, like my music uh, that I was into, I didn't want to give up. You know, I I thought Christian music was really kind of corny. And these are the days before Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant. So Uh, I was going to say it kind of was, although Larry Norman was cool. There was a lot of room for improvement. I'll say that in the (laughs) contemporary Christian world. (laughs) That's fair. So, um, so, uh, I was like, you know, uh, Hey, I'm, I'm really, even though I'm from the Northeast, I'm into like Southern rock, you know, Leonard Skinner, the Almond brothers. And I, that's the era I come from. So I love that music and that culture, but I I knew I kind of had to make some changes. So uh, eventually I moved to Florida when I was 19 years old because I got a job at the Postal Service. And I was like, wow, man, I'm 19 years old. I'm going to get an adult job walking around near the beach delivering mail and they're going to pay me for that. (laughs) You know, I mean, yeah, I'll take that job. So, uh, uh, So I moved to Florida and met my wife here. She was also a mail carrier in the Fort Lauderdale post office. And, uh, so we dated for a couple of years, wound up getting engaged. She was also a Christian. She got saved at the same youth events that I would go to, but just in the next town over. And, uh, to, to speed up the story a little bit, you know, I guess when you're, when you're getting married, and you're engaged, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I hope I'm making the right decision. Lord, is this the right girl for me? How would I know? Well, it, this is really bizarre the way God showed me that it was the right woman for me because we've been married now for 36 years. Oh, wow. Is uh, We went to a premarital counseling meeting and the blonde beach bum surfboard preacher who showed up with the surfboards on the roof when I was 12 and he was 16. Yeah. Now he's like, 30 years old, and he's a pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, where D. J. D. James Kennedy was from. And uh, we made this appointment to go and and uh, go to premarital counseling. And we're sitting in the waiting room, and I can hear him counseling another couple on the other side of the door in his office. I'm thinking, man, that voice sounds so familiar. Where do I know that from? Because I hadn't seen that barefoot uh, yeah. beach bum preacher for like, 10 years. And when the door opened up, it was him. And now he's on staff at a big church. And we were like the first couple he wound up marrying. Oh, wow. And I was in his office praying for a sign. I was like, Lord, show me that this is the right woman (laughs) as we go into this premarital counseling. And when it was him, I was like, okay, I got it. That's the sign. (laughs) This will work. I'll take it. Oh, that's that's so amazing. What an amazing uh, coincidence or providence, if you will. Yes. Wow. Yes. I love that. Um, that's interesting. Do you know? So this is the church that D. James Kennedy was at. You said right. So yeah. Did you uh, do you know Christy Kennedy? Uh, is that her daughter? Is no, her that's she. Friend? She was a. She was also. I don't know if it was at that church or not, but she was uh, mentored by D. James Kennedy and and his wife. And uh, oh, I just interviewed her. Yeah. So she she's been on recently. As well. So uh, I'm oh, sure okay. it's a big place. So maybe not, you know, I, I'm not assuming anything, but, um, or maybe I am, but it was interesting. That's the second time he's come up in, in last week. 
Anyway, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for him. He was the one of the first preachers that really cemented me in the fact that this whole Christianity thing is very smart. And when you listen to his style of preaching, which was very, very like fact based um, and just like scientifically based and mm-hmm. historically based. It was kind of the platform he's, he preached from. It was like, man, this dude is smart. This isn't just some, you know, some guy trying to get everybody to drink the Kool-Aid here. This guy really knows what he's talking about. He's well-educated. And if he believes, why shouldn't I believe that, you know, why shouldn't any of us believe? Yeah. Yeah. So it was more of a teaching style than a, than a preaching style, perhaps. Right. Right. Yeah. How did that impact you then? So I don't know, like, how did you learn, but what are some of the early lessons? Uh, you learned to trust God with your choice in a spouse, which is great. What, like what, how else did God kind of teach you to, to trust him or to, to, you know, uh, walk with him in faith? Um, you know, when you, when you just kind of start going through life circumstances and you see that you make a certain decision and whether the decision was right or wrong at the time, you realize that God has your back, mm. so to speak. You know, you, you'll just, and, and sometimes you don't see it when you're looking for it, but when you do the hindsight thing and you look at, wow, the way that circumstance lined up with why I didn't get that position or get to play in that band or buy that property or, or um, you know, there was a reason for that because everything wasn't in alignment the way God wanted it to be. And then something better happened for you down the road. But there's also been times in my, you know, 40 year walk now that, you know, I've, I've strayed to the side mm-hmm. and I've realized that, wow, I've gotten wet. How did I wind up over here? You yeah. know, I don't see God's voice and I'm not following. I'm, I got away from the word and, uh, you know, it's, it's through several books and I, I really think reading books, in in addition to the Bible, Christian-based books can really help bring you back to center. Yeah. Well, tell us one of those stories about how you, you know, a time when you felt like you'd kind of wandered away a little bit, and then God brought you back. Yeah. It's. Uh, I would say probably the biggest thing was in the uh, in the real estate crash. Um, you know, I had here, I had built a portfolio and, and to kind of tell you my story and being a mailman, it wasn't, but about maybe five years on the job that I really kind of got bored with that job. And I realized this is not my highest calling in life. God has something bigger mm. for me than this. And my wife was like, yeah, and a bigger income too. So do something. <laughs> about that. So, uh, uh, I, I started to get into the whole house flipping thing because here was a mailman. So I was either walking around or driving around in my neighborhoods on my mail route. And I would see houses all day long. So I got to see through the mail. Remember this is back in the eighties. There was no internet. There was no cell phone. All there was, was the U S mail. So when, what happens when somebody goes into foreclosure, you know, uh, bank sends them a certified letter. Yeah. <laughs> and the only one knows that, that, that there's an opportunity to buy a foreclosure is the mailman be, and, and the guy who didn't make the payment and the bank because they didn't get the payment. Yeah. So I would literally just run into circumstances where people would like beg me to buy their house and take over their payments and help them save their credit. So that's how I got started in real estate. Well, it took me probably about 20 years to accumulate a portfolio of about 30 six or 37 houses that I was renting out all on my mail routes. Wow. And one day I woke up so stressed out trying to manage everything myself. My wife said, you know what? She's like, you just got to quit that stupid job. (laughs) So I said, honey, you're right. So I quit the job. And then that was just before the downturn where, you know, the the whole real estate market kind of shut off. You were able to take advantage of somebody else's short sale. Mm -hmm. Um, where there's a crisis, there's a blessing. And at the same time, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. If you're, (laughs) you know, if you're you're in the right business. Right. So, uh, it was a tough time for me. I mean, we had houses that we had bought for like $50,000 that grew up to be $300,000 houses. And then all of a sudden we found out after fixing the roofs when they leaked and putting the air conditioners in when they blew up that, 20 years later, they're back down to $50,000. Oh, it wow. was like 
the biggest bubble we had ever seen. So what that did to me, what, what was my, what was my valley in that situation? Man, I was like hanging on. Um, we had to short sale, uh, not everything, but probably about half the properties we owned. And, uh, I had a lot of sleepless nights. I just thought I was going to die of a heart attack because everything I worked hard for, for 20 years, mm -hmm. it was just starting to undo itself. And, uh, you know, I, I started to, um, I got a job as a, um, trainer and went on the road, started to hang out in bars at night. And I was like, I'm a Christian. What am I doing here? But that was, you know, a time where I just walked away from God and figured, um, you know, I, I just got to get back on track. And it wasn't until actually a pivotal point for me was I, I read a book by Joyce Meyer called Battlefield of the Mind. Oh, yeah. You ever read that book? I haven't, but I, I respect her a lot. Wow, man. You got to read that book. It is life changing. And what, so, what was it? What was it for you? Like, how did that? It sounds like it's a mindset book. What did how did that change your mindset? Well, the way it changed your mindset is. Satan doesn't show up in a red suit with a pitchfork and horns. <laughs> That's too obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he is in the most subtle thing where he knows he can get you to trip up. And you should just never, sometimes you should just never let your mind just freely wander. You got to bring it back under control. You know, sometimes you get to have these pity parties and, you know, I'm sure everybody in your listening audience has, you know, challenges and have been through mountains and valleys. Oh, yeah. But when you come to realize that if you take every thought captive to Christ, like Paul said, it's it's really that's what it's about. Yeah. Really so, every day. So it sounds like it, it that book helped you kind of get your mind right with kind of what, where God was in the situation. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And it helped me see, you know, decisions I made and it helped me, helped me understand that, Hey, get, you're saved. Yeah. You know, you're not going to go to hell. That's great. But when you're going to start that relationship back, you lost your relationship. Yeah. And, and an, another person I learned a lot from their teachings is Tony Evans. Mm. He, he's got, Oh man, so much good material. Was there a, was there a book that, uh, of his that particularly spoke to you? Yeah, uh, Destiny is a good book of his. Okay. And about a year ago, he did a CD series called uh, Fasting. And let me tell you, it's it's not just about how to not eat food. I mean, it talks about the whole spiritual basis behind it. And it's just it goes really deep. So if you have not heard that, I recommend you, you get that. That's really good stuff. Very cool. I will put links to both of those books in the show notes at halfwaytherepodcast.com, friends. You can always uh, check that out there. You don't have to worry about writing it down if you're driving. Just go to halfwaytherepodcast.com. Um, okay, so yeah, that's really interesting that that the you know the the crash. I guess that makes sense as a real estate guy that the crash would be a, sort of a, a pivotal point for you. So you decided then, okay, I'm going to get back to to going toward toward the Lord. What did that look like for you? What it looked like was really just number one, just really going back to basics with what I believed about God and. Sometimes you can get so far into books that you, you get away from the basic of the word itself, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest basis we as Christians enjoy is just reading from the Bible yeah, and, totally. and, and, and then understanding how that applies to your life too is equally as important, I think. Yeah. So, so, so what, what books specifically like or with the scripture, like what brought you back? What, what, how did God speak to you? And did you have like an experience that God Use you remember a particular time when you were reading and something jumped out at you and changed your whole world? Yeah. You know, uh, if you want to put it down to one, probably one incident, I, I probably had maybe four incidents in my entire life where I literally heard a voice mm. while I was in my car. And there was, it scared me. There was like nobody in my car. I'm alone. And I was sitting at a traffic light and things were just not going well. Uh, the market had tanked where I was wondering how I was going to make my bills that month. And I just remember praying at a stoplight and all of a sudden I heard this voice out of nowhere just said, 
don't worry, Tom, I will feed you. And I just, <laughs> I literally heard that. And if someone was sitting next to me, I don't know if they would have verbally heard it in their ears, but I know I heard it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally believe that. I've I had one of those experiences, not as glamorous as at a stoplight. It was, you know, I'll, I'll tell you some of the time, but it's, uh, but it's kind of as a voice that comes from outside of you, right? It comes and you yeah. don't, you don't know it's, so it's like your ear It's coming from outside, but it's sort of inside too. Yeah. Was that your experience? Yeah. Something like that? That was, that was my experience and there were others, but that was probably my major one. What did you do with that? What I, I, well, I just nailed it to my heart and knew mm. that, okay, I'm going to be okay. And this is for a reason. It's for a reason, but there are a lot of promises that, that God makes to us that he wants us to hold them to. And I just was listening. I was reading something in one of Tony Evans books the other day about taking some of God's promises and throwing them back up in God's face saying, this is, this is what you promised me. I'm, I will follow you. And, and in a way sort of challenge him in a sense that, Hey, we can cling to these and they will happen, but it, 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 you have to step out of the boat to see that these things are going to happen. Yeah, totally. You have to take that step of faith, right? You have to, you have to actually believe and then trust God to come through. He loves that stuff. Like that, that is where, you know, it's all over scripture. I've been really reading um, scripture in just a really, to me, it's a new way. It's probably not new to anybody else, but to me, it was like, you know, just reading stories of somebody like, um, I'm thinking of Gideon right now. So, you know, I mean, that guy, he didn't want to go out there, right? Like that's, he was outnumbered. He was outgunned. And then God told him to like, cut his army down. Like, what are you talking about, God? But he had to do it in order to see the victory that God was going to give him, right? Right. right. Yeah. And that's that's the way that God works. And so you had to do the same thing. You were going through this, and he gave you exactly what he what you needed in order to hear that he's going to take care of you and to trust him. Yeah. And but he wants to see you move toward him first. And probably a, a great illustration that I remember reading just about a year ago about that is even though we've heard the story about Abraham and Isaac, you know, it wasn't until Abraham raised that knife and started to bring it down on Isaac that the angel said, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's a ram over there. But the, the point is that, you know, until uh, it wasn't until he started to lower that knife down that he said, ah, now I know I can trust you. Yeah. Now, how many of us do that in our lives? That's that's a tough one. It it is. If you have a son, right? Well, and I wonder, you know, I, the scripture doesn't tell us. Hebrews kind of elaborates on that and says that he that he um you know trusted that God could bring him back from the dead. I don't know if that's really what was going through Abraham's mind or not, but you know, I wonder how much he wrestled with it. Right, all the way up the mountain. Oh, Can you yeah. imagine right. Isaac's asking him questions like, "We don't have a sacrifice, God. What's gonna go? Or Dad, what's going on?" Right, and um, like that. Just you can imagine as a father what that would have been like to just sit there and kind of wrestle with that. Even even if he was trusting God, even if he believed, okay, this is it. You know, this was his promise that this is the promised child. I don't understand what what we're doing with this, but maybe this is what he had all, all along, yeah. and he did it anyway. Seemingly without question, he's like, "Okay, I'm gonna go." Right? It's boy, that's obedience. I I don't know that I have that obedience. Yeah, that well, is but obedience. Here's here's the other thing I think about that. I don't think that obedience was automatic. Uh, it was learned, right? It was learned through the years, and we have all these other stories of Abraham messing up and you know screwing things up and you know sending his wife out and all these things. He learned how to obey God one experience at a time, which is why we talk about experiences here. Uh, you yeah. know, like, cause I can I can read all I want. I can read scripture, but I, my biggest moments have been when I've learned from God directly or had an experience with him that sent me in the right direction. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's a really powerful story. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so what have you learned about yourself? Cause I, what I love about your story, you, you mentioned it, you know, you, you were doing this as a, you're working as a, a postman and, uh, delivered mail and going, this is not my life. Like, this is not what I'm supposed to do. Right. This is not 
there's so much more in me that I could, that God's made me for. And so you took advantage of the opportunity in front of you, which I totally commend and think is awesome. Um, but it sounds like you had to go on a little bit of a journey with your identity with God as well. What, what's that been like? My identity with God. Um, does that resonate at all? If it doesn't, it's okay. But that's, yeah, that's what I see. Um, restate that question. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. So, no, that's all right. So I guess I get it. where I'm going is, is like, how is, how, I, what I hear from you in going, Hey, this is not my, my highest and best calling. Right. Correct. Yeah. Is go, is saying there's more that God has for me and who he's made me to be. So I'm wondering how, el- what other ways you've learned that? What other ways that, um, you you look you can look at it now because th- this was a while ago right so I guess ten mm-hmm. years ago you, you quit that but what um, like what have you learned what has God taught you about yourself and who He's made you to be in that process I think um, probably the major thing is he is that He wants me to be more like Him and conformed to who Christ is and. I've been in situations as a real estate, you know, coach and supposed guru. I've done a lot of, you know, hotel presentations Mm -hmm. over the years and speaking engagements and wrote several books and so forth. And I I got to realize that, you know, people would tend to look at you and put you up on a pedestal of some sort and say, wow, I want to be like that guy. And I used to think that you know, I have to have this image that, uh, that I'm somebody who everybody wants to be, to be able to sell. But it, God has shown me that I'm, I'm the wrong mirror. It's like, don't look at me as the mirror. <laughs> look at Jesus as the mirror. Yeah. And, and if I always think of that in a mirror, uh, fat s- f- sort of way that, you know, I want to reflect my life to look more like him. And, you know, so I got friends of mine that are also in the real estate teaching business. They drive Ferraris and, you know, Lamborghinis and all this stuff and Gucci shoes and watches. I, I, I'm a simple dude, man. <laughs> I drive an F-150 pickup truck. You know, I'm in front of my barn right here, whereas, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have horses, but my neighbors do. I like looking at them, but I don't want to deal with them. But right. <laughs> um, it just helped me to be, you know, just kind of be a little more humble with stuff and not so much in your face. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's a really interesting perspective on how Christ sort of changes you in the industry. Yeah, because there's there's some places in the whole information marketing industry in general that mm. can be a real slippery slope. Totally. And yeah, just the way people attract clients and and the image they bring about. Yeah, uh, dude, I'm so I, glad you brought that up because I'm. I'm kind of wrestling with that right now. I told you I just wrote my first Bible study and I've been working on this for a while. And man, you know, how to market it out there and make, make a promise without over promising or, you know, saying things that I can't uphold is really hard sometimes. Right. And at the same time, you know, you want whatever project you start to embark on, you want it to be successful. Yeah. And we all know that there's certain emotional and psychological triggers that cause people to buy. Right. 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 So, you know, you want to be honest with people. You don't want to, you know, be like a BSer out there who just, you know, tells people any old thing, you know, and not be authentic. Right. So you you have to be true to yourself. So, yeah. So I'm always looking in that mirror to make sure I'm not crossing the line. Yeah. Yeah. And yet it's also true that if you have something that can help people and you don't offer it to them, you're hurting them. Right. Like that's actually not going the right direction. So. Right. Interesting. All right. Well, a little marketing, uh, a little marketing advice, friends, for you um, there. So, Tom, tell us a little bit. So, you you tell us that you're you're speaking and teaching. Tell us a little bit more about some of the stuff that you're offering and that people are um, that are buying from you. Sure. Well, um, what I do now is I, I currently have about. 30 to 35 coaching students I'm working with now. And I coach really pretty much guys that want to get started in the house flipping space from all over the country. And I guess the advantage to me 
uh, to be able to help people is because I've been doing this for so many years and I give people different marketing assignments to do, I get to see how marketing responds in those parts of the country. So through practical experience, I I've seen, you know, hard earned dollars spent and see what it produces and knowing what markets I I know exactly what the Denver market is like. (laughs) I've had students in Pueblo. I've had students in Aurora in all those areas around there. Yeah. That's pretty cool. What, what, uh, what should I know here, Tom? (laughs) <laughs> well, uh, the, I think there's going to be a shift in your market because um, I, I like to say the reefer madness is is the kind of the term I use for the market. Yeah, uh, the reefer madness is uh, it's it's spreading into other states, whereas it was once exclusive there. So yeah, everyone who's into that sort of thing wanted to be there to you know to live. But now that it's in Colorado and Nevada and in Washington and uh, I think several other states. Yeah. You guys don't have the monopoly on that. So how does that react to the market? Well, it it may make it soften, but Colorado is a beautiful place to live. It is. We we have a lot of people coming from California who, you know, yeah, they they sell out there and then they come here and and uh, because they can just buy a house out here on what they made out there, you know. Yeah, probably more affordably. Totally, totally. So. Uh, well, that's very interesting. I, I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so you're coaching people who want to flip houses. How do people get in touch with you? They want to want to know about that. Yeah, they could visit my website. It's it's called millionairemailman.com, and I've got a free book they can download there. And you know, if you, if you'd like to know really the basic steps to get to your first check. And be able to to just wholesale a house. And if you don't know what that means, it basically means not buying it to fix it and flip it. It just means, you know, selling that contract to somebody else and make a quick profit and run. Hmm. I wrote a book on how to do that. And if you want to text the the uh, the word mailman to a short text code, it's called three one nine nine six. Just text the word mailman to 31996. It'll send you a free download so you can download the latest book that I just wrote. Oh, perfect. That's great. So I will have that link right in the show notes so that everybody can grab that there. And uh, or I'll, have, I'll have those instructions there if you, if you uh, didn't get it. But give us that code one more time. Yeah, it's 31996, and it's called a short text code. So you would text the mess, the word mailman. It can be all lowercase, it's fine, to that short text code instead of a phone number, uh, those five digits, 31996, and I'll send you a link immediately for to download the book. Perfect. That's great. All right. Well, Tom, what else, anything else you want to leave us with? Yes. Um, I would say whatever, your tr- whatever trial you're in, if you're in business and self-employed and you know what that feels like or... You're, you were a government employee for 16 years like me and looking for a way to break out. I just want to say enjoy the journey because it can be, it can be a fun journey as long as you, you keep God by your side and you look to him for, for guidance. So uh, whether it's ups or downs, enjoy the journey. That's perfect. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Friends, like I said, you can get links to the books we talked about to Tom's website at halfwaytherepodcast.com. I'll have those instructions how to get his book for free. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate your story. Thanks, Eric. It was fun to be on your show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> 